Good, good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? You are aware, I hope, that uh, the, the source book of our... Uh, uh, information for this program is the most wonderful book in the world. It is the Bible. The Bible, which is that majestic, wonderful book that God himself, the God of the universe, has given to us. He has written it so that we might know something more about us ourselves than we could ever find in any other place. We might know where mankind came from and what the final destiny of man is. That we might know that we were created in the image of God and therefore we're altogether accountable to God for the way we live. And uh, therefore we have to, the Bible becomes super, super important that we know what God has to say to us. Oh my, isn't it wonderful, isn't it marvelous that God has given us the Bible? And isn't it wonderful that we can combine our prayers and our resources in a in a ministry like Family Radio and send that, that the knowledge of the Bible, the importance of the Bible uh, out to the entire world so that people on the other side of the planet, of this planet, uh, people in this continent and that continent can recognize uh, and be told also read the Bible, listen to what the Bible says. That is God's Word. Nothing could be better uh, uh, a better gift to mankind than they know that they are to read the Bible. And uh, this is what we do with Family Radio, and this is why it is so wonderful that we can use our lives. We can lay down a little of our lives and, and uh, use our finances, pooling them together so that together we can do something that we can't do it. Uh, as individuals, as individuals, of course, we cannot reach whole continents on the other side of the world or on this side of the world. Well, this is the wonder of uh, uh, a merciful God that He has given us His Word and He allows us to send out His Word into the world. And we also are able to use that word on this program as our authority, as our resource. Well, we're uh, interested in hearing from you, and so shall we take our first call from our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Camping. I know you teach that uh, faith is a work, and I think I found some verses to support that. John six twenty eight and twenty nine. Uh, John six twenty eight and twenty nine. Let's see once what that says. John six. And then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Yes, and it's uh, both from two vantage points. It's God's work that we are to believe, and and uh, if we do believe, that is God, the kind of work God expects of us once we are believers. This is a very good verse that proves that, that also that faith is work. Jesus as their Savior it's the work that God has done to make them believe that. Yes, this this is the uh, the first focus of this verse that it is the work of God that we do believe. It isn't our work at all. I, I have one more question, Brother Camping. If you can explain it, and I'll hang up and listen over the radio. Job chapter nineteen, verse twenty-six. Job chapter nineteen, verse twenty-six. There we read, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet not in my flesh, but from or away from my flesh, shall I see God. The translator uh, didn't translate that quite as well as it should be. It, uh, it, it, the 
it should have been tra translated instead of not yet in my flesh, but yet from my flesh, that is, out, away from my flesh, I shall see God. And thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, uh, Brother Camping. Yes. A, a question for you. Um, the uh, minister was praying for some people to be healed, and I was just wondering, does the Bible say anything about how when somebody is prayed for, for healing, some people are healed, and everyone that he prayed for, like, uh, fell out or, like, collapsed? Does the Bible say anything about that? Well, the Bible says don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication make your requests known to the Lord. And and uh, if we have a, a friend or a loved one who is, is ill, uh, maybe dying of a cancer or something, uh, it's very appropriate to tell of our concerns to the Lord. Oh, Lord, is it possible that uh, this person might become healed? We don't pray for miracles. We know there are no miracles. If God is going to heal, he'll, we, he'll work through medicine or through uh, operation or through natural means that that's but if anyone ever becomes well of any kind of a disease it's because God has healed that person and and God heals people who are prayed for and God heals people who are not prayed for and a lot of people who are prayed for die uh, of their illness and a lot of people who are not prayed for die of their illness and so I, we don't know what God's will is. That that illness may be terminal. We may not know whether it is uh, uh, terminal or not, but it may be. And we certainly don't want to pray for for God to uh, do something that is not His plan. And so the true believer, as he prays for healing, for uh, for God's mercy on someone who is very ill, we pray. But O oh Lord, may Your perfect will be done, because You do everything perfectly. And so uh, we're content that that God will do what is best, and and yet we have the the relief, we have the uh, comfort of being able to talk to uh, to the Lord all about it. Oh, okay. So basically, uh, if someone's prayed for and they command them to, in Jesus' name to be like raised out of a wheelchair, that's not really of God then. Well, that, the that's fact not really is, a, a you, prayer that should be prayed there. Well, no, the fact is there are people who uh, think that God is a servant, and, and they're saying, Oh, Lord, uh, I trust you that you will do this now. Heal this person, and they expect that person instantly to become healed. Well, now, if you see that happen, the likelihood is that there's deception going on because... Uh, uh, and there's an enormous amount of chicanery, a lot, an enormous amount of deception going on in that connection. But uh, we, we don't, uh, we don't, we should never have that low opinion of God that He is some kind of a servant. We come trembling before Him, and we beg of Him, and and we don't know what His will is, and and yet we we can beseech Him on behalf of someone. And yet we, we ultimately uh, know that God knows what is best, and we only want His will to be done. Thank you, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, it's good to speak with you. I'm a regular listener. I hear many uh, pastors speak of this age of accountability, and they seem to pick up an age bracket of 14 years or 12 years. Where do they come up with that? They come up with that because they have gotten themselves into a box. They start out with a wrong doctrine that's totally unbiblical, that Christ paid for the sins of everybody, and uh, and that is totally uh, unbiblical. But that's what they believe uh, is the Bible it teaches that. And then they they come up with the next statement. In order to become saved, all we have to do is reach out in faith and and accept the Lord Jesus, and then we become saved. Well, then they have the problem of the children because the children can't understand any of this, a two-year-old, a one-year-old. Uh, so does that mean then they can't become saved? They are not able 
to understand the principle that they have to reach out and accept Christ. So they come up with another faulty, totally unbiblical doctrine that children up until a certain day, age are are uh, uh, not not uh, accountable to God for their actions and if they would die in that childhood position they'd automatically go to heaven the whole business is a man-made scheme a man-made uh, set of doctrines uh, because if they would read uh, Psalm 58 for example there God says that the wicked go astray from their mother's womb speaking lies and and uh, the wicked of course are everybody there's none righteous no not one and the, and the fact is it doesn't require our action to become saved uh, God can save a baby in the womb just as well as he can save um, a college uh, professor it's uh, it doesn't require our intellect it requires the action of God to apply the word of God to the heart of the one that he want, wishes to save okay thank you and one other remark on the uh, the church age I, I do agree with you and as a matter of fact that was one of the doctrines that was preached at the church uh, and my wife and I just withdrew our membership uh, and our money is better spent being sent to family radio for true salvation or spreading the gospel that is throughout the world rather than uh, expensive life enrichment centers and, and things of that nature uh, and so keep uh, I, I do uh, hope the Lord blesses you richly as you continue your work well I can tell you you know uh, uh, we uh, are delighted that we can join together with so many others and and with one purpose, and that is not to uh, adulate our to get adulation for ourselves or or to uh, build uh, fancy things for ourselves or, or live in fancy homes or fancy buildings or whatever. We have only one purpose, and that is to use these funds that are are sent in to family radio that the gospel can go out into all the world and and it's a huge task because you know this world has over six billion people in it and and to reach the whole world and and every true believer should have that desire because God says go ye into all the world with the gospel and they should have that desire to reach as many people as possible with their funds, whatever they can uh, feel they want to to uh, uh, lay on the altar of service. And so we're de I'm just delighted that we can uh, join together in this kind of a ministry. We're all servants. We're just humble servants serving Him. Uh, each of us has a little part in it. Uh, uh, each of us do what we can do, and together we we get a job done that uh, that uh, any single individual could never never do. I agree with you 100 percent, brother Camping. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to, to Open Forum. Yes, uh, good evening, Brother Camping. I uh, hope you're well as I'm speaking to you now. Um, the reason I'm calling, sir, is because um, there's that saying, um, let go and let God. And I was wondering if you can please tell me uh, in the Bible where I could um, perhaps read to uh, encourage me this to, uh, you know, let go uh, as far as control and, and let God, you know. Well, the, that of course is a is a phrase that is used. It's not quoted from the Bible. Let go and let God. But uh, the Bible does say, "I can do all things." Let's see. That would be Philippians, I believe. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, that is, uh, it's Christ who has to do it. Or uh, Philippians chapter. Uh, uh, chapter uh, 2 verse 13 uh, where, where we read for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure and there uh, uh, I would suggest as I tell everybody and tell myself when you're puzzling with something like this 
just start reading the Bible. Just start reading the Bible. Uh, because uh, not only will eventually you'll find uh, verses that will address your question, but in the meanwhile, as you're reading, you're going to find a lot of other neat truths that you uh, hadn't even thought were in the Bible that will pop out if you read carefully carefully but read the philippians that's a real good book to read and i think you'll find uh, some answers there okay uh okay uh thank you very much uh i just wanted to ask one more thing uh regarding uh church uh when when you go to church and and um you start hearing the hymns and uh, the songs and and if a person becomes emotional so emotional um in your opinion, does that mean that the Lord is reaching them in, in, through their, in, in, you know, deep down in their hearts? I, 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 I really don't know. I don't know what causes someone to become emotional. First of all, some people are very emotional. Just by nature, they're very emotional. Sometimes a particular song uh, strikes them. But that, uh, finally, that is not the test. That is not the test whether we really are a child of God. The test that, that really is important is, am I ready to do the will of God? I can be very emotional and yet, uh, and yet disobey God all the time I, because I, there are things in the Bible I don't want to do. I don't like what God is telling me to do. But, uh, yeah, and I can, on the other hand, have a rather stoic... Uh, uh, personality where emotions don't show and yet there can burn within my heart an intense desire to do the will of God so it we're, we're all very uh, very uh, uh, complex individuals and uh, and I don't think anybody can decide just what causes this or causes that kind of a reaction but but Deep down, the Lord knows uh, your your heart, which which is what where it counts. Well, the, the, the Lord the Lord knows what's going on in our minds. He knows He knows the intents of our mind even before we think the thought. God knows the direction that we're going in. Nothing is hid from the eyes of God. But when we are asking the question, "Am I a child of God or not?" and that's really the essence of your question. That's what we all want to know. The, the answer has to be, uh, and, and if we look at ourselves very honestly, we, and this is the only way to do it, we can kid ourselves, we can uh, uh, deceive ourselves and think, well, you know, I, I, basically I want to do the will of God, and, and, uh, but we're only looking at the Bible somewhat superficially. But if we find in our hearts that uh, we have a, a, an intense liking for the Word of God. We uh, and and even though uh, we read things that are very disturbing to us, yet we read them and and pray that we might be obedient if we're called to do something. And we find again and again an intense desire to be obedient. Uh, then we begin to get the uh, the. Uh, a sense of it that in all likelihood I am a child of God because only a true child of God will on a on an ongoing basis uh, do the will of God regardless of what is called for. I, I really I really thank you so much for for this time and I've been listening to your station for so many years and it has helped me so much and um, God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, yes. I have a question uh, concerning the uh, three days and three nights that Jesus spent in the heart of the earth. Yes. Um, I know. I understand about the three nights, that it would be Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Yes. But is it possible to go to, to uh, Genesis in chapter 1, verse 5, where God says that the evening and the morning were the first day that he sets, does he set down a principle where he's uh, uh, saying that, that a day is the evening and the morning, and then the, the evening, I'm sorry, the morning can be third, can be um, uh, Thursday night to Friday morning, 
and then you have Friday night to Saturday morning, and then Saturday night to Sunday morning. Would that fit? I, I think that's a legitimate observation. I think that would have some merit. Uh, I, uh, it certainly uh, is not contrary to the scripture, and it is true that the uh, in the uh, in the Judea at that time. Um, in accordance with the Jewish calendar, the day began at at uh, at uh, uh, sundown uh, of the day before, and continued to sun sundown of the day that uh, that uh, that we're thinking about. And so, uh, the third day, in a real sense, uh, could have been thought of as from. Uh, Let's see, that would have been uh, uh, Saturday night until Sunday morning. It's possible. I, I've never thought about it that way, and so, uh, uh, it, but, it's, but it is an idea that, that is possible. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Uh, good evening. Yes. Um, I uh, was listening to your program, and um, I'm a new uh, born-again believer, I would say, um, uh, in terms of actually realizing the uh, blessings of the Spirit. It's only been recently in my life. And so, uh, speaking as a believer, I can attest to uh, uh, these days being, in the, uh, being the days of, the, of tribulation and it being evident in the church. However, my question to you is, is that since we all have the anointing within us, and it's the anointing that leads us, um, why is your uh, emphasis uh, on action? Why not um, rest in the faith and trust in the Lord as none of his elect will be uh, deceived? Well, simply because the, uh, the result of being saved uh, does cause action in our life. Uh, we read that in First John chapter two, verse three. If we say we know Him, we will keep His commandments. That's action. Let's say a person really believes I'm a child of God, and yet he's an alcoholic. Well, the Bible says that a drunkard shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, so that is the clear evidence that in his action. He is not a child of God. And when the Bible uh, be, uh, indicates that we are to get out of the churches and we do not want to take that action, then we have to ask ourselves, am I really a child of God? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a theoretical situation. It's a matter of listening to what God says and then taking action. If someone... Uh, stubbornly says no I I don't want to leave I don't think it's the time or whatever r rationale they have everybody has their alibi or their reasoning as to why they don't want to take action but then it's like the alcoholic who says I, I can't give up my drink even though I'm trying real hard to live exactly like a Christian he but he's still he's still uh, in rebellion against God well, uh, also, I have another question. As uh, Jesus has led me, or, or is leading me, from darkness towards light, I am gaining further insight into the Scripture through my relationship with Him. And one of the verses in the Scripture, uh, um, the verse about um, us being able to bind and loose things in the earth and it being loosed in heaven, um, the kingdom of God seems to be within us. I mean, joy, peace, and righteousness in this earth. And those uh, um, blockades towards access to that king kingdom, the, the bondage to sin, um, that's the power that we have through the Spirit to bind and loose within our lives. Oh, mind. well, now we have to be careful. Yeah, you're quoting from uh, Matthew chapter 16 or Matthew chapter 18. Whatsoever shall be bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, or whatsoever is loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. First of all, God there is talking to the apostles who were the beginning of the New Testament church. And secondly, in our King James Bible, we do not have the 
verb tenses correctly set forth. Actually, the verb tenses go like this. Whatsoever shall be bound on earth shall, having been bound in heaven, whatsoever is loosed on earth, shall, having been loosed in heaven. In other words, the prior action is God's action. And so the church, as it is commanded, the local congregations, as they were commanded to send out the gospel into the world, uh, they were very close to the salvation of that person, but the prior action was God's action. He had to actually do the saving, and then the uh, church was actually to, to uh, 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 see the change in that person's life, and, and that, church, that individual became a member of the congregation. He was baptized in water, and, uh, and he made confession of faith, and so on, and became a member. But unfortunately, the, the church, in their spiritual uh, uh, pride, and I, and I say this very matter-of-factly, because I've been, I was an elder for many, many years in, in churches, and I, I know this experience very much, uh, they concluded, we, we, uh, we uh, are uh, actually in charge of getting people saved. We don't put it that crassly. But if people become baptized in water, and if they are, if they are, if they make confession of faith, and and if they promise to uh, obey the the rules of the congregation, then we uh, are confident they are saved, so they can be a member in full communion. They are a saved membership, and yet uh, uh, God may have not saved them at all. And so it's it's because. We, we decided that we are the ones who do it. Now, it's true that the church is the one that presented these individuals with the gospel, and it's through the gospel that they do become saved. And the church has the privilege of welco welcoming those whom God did save into their membership, but they themselves were never uh, the uh, movers of that person's salvation. God, that work had to be entirely God's work. And if I may add, and hopefully you might concur, that um, God is the sower of the seed, and um, we actually prepare others for his time of uh, visitation with them. Oh, excuse me. No, that's not possible. We don't prepare anybody. God has to prepare the hearts. We don't prepare the hearts. We are the sowers of the seed. We, or we actually broadcast the seed. Uh, and, and, but God has to do the full action of causing that seed to find uh, root in the heart of an individual. There's nothing we can do to prepare anybody. That helps a whole lot in this matter is Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, I admit that all kinds of Bibles are on this. Uh, available today, and they've, the, the uh, uh, publishers have changed that word from of to in, faith in Jesus Christ, but the Greek will not allow that. It is justified by the faith of the Lord Jesus. He has to do the whole work of salvation. Uh, we uh, we uh, are there uh, sh uh, uh, bringing the word of God so that God can work through it, to save that person if that's his good pleasure and and as throughout the church age we were there to welcome that person into the into the uh, uh, local congregation as a which was the external representation of the kingdom of God now that we are sending out the gospel during the latter rain period the final season we don't welcome them into an organization we uh, we simply send the gospel out and know that there's a great multitude that are being saved and we know that God cares for them and uh, and uh, in a very short time we'll come right to the end of the world. Thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please. Welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes, Brother Kevin, can you explain what a free will offering is that's talked about in the Old Testament? The free will offering? Yes. Uh, I'm not able to distinguish that from any other offering. The fact is, uh, it was an offering out of a person's heart. There were 
there were ties that had to be brought. The ties, I, I suppose we could explain it this way. The ties, the 10% of the produce that came from the farm that the individual had, uh, were brought into the temple treasury to use to be used to support the Levites from whom the priesthood came. And they were essentially a part of the ceremonial law because they typified, they typified the, uh, the um, uh, idea that, uh, that we are out there harvesting the crops and, and uh, the, uh, that is the uh, uh, harvesting the world of those who became saved because the, the gospel had been, uh, had been sown out there, the gospel had been shared and God had blessed it and, and now these people have become saved and they're brought into the kingdom of God. They are typified by the tithes. The free will offering would be uh, uh, over and above that. It was the idea that uh, we offer ourselves, and uh, everything about us is uh, as at the at the um, uh, re uh, ready to be used according to God's will. We, uh, I suppose, uh, a real good verse that would tie in would be Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. We, God uh, wants everything, and he gives us the opportunity to, for us to lay our lives down on the altar of service as we give our monies and our time for the big purpose, the marvelous purpose of sending the gospel into the world. Um, but why was it called a free will offering? Yes, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I've never worked on that phrase, and so I can't. I, I'd be speculating if I tried to say more. I'm sorry. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Yeah, um, Camera, you have just spoken about um, uh, about healing. Yes. Yeah, um, I would, can you please uh, take a look at James 5.13? Yes, James 5, there it talks about uh, if anyone is sick among you, or let me turn to that a moment. In James 5, it says, uh, is any sick among you, that's verse 14, and the word sick here is the word uh, 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 asthenio that uh, identifies with any kind of illness. It can be mental illness, physical illness, uh, spiritual illness. It's someone who is very, very sick. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now, why do they call for the elders of the church? The elders have nothing to do with physical healing. They are concerned about healing the sin-sick soul of a person that is by uh, bringing the gospel if that person has not become saved. And we see that in the next phrase. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. To anoint with oil means that it's the oil of the Holy Spirit, that we are bringing the gospel or trusting that hopefully the Holy Spirit will apply that word to the heart of that person if he has not been saved. And that is emphasized in the next verse. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now, what we don't see in our English Bible is this word sick is entirely different from the word in verse 14. This word sick is the word camno. It's used two other places in the New Testament. Uh, and in both places, it has to do with spiritual fatigue. It has nothing to do with physical illness. Uh, someone who is depressed or someone who is spiritually ill. Uh, and the Lord shall raise him up. And what do we read in Ephesians 2? When God saves an individual, he is raised up with Christ. And then it says, if he have committed sins, and everyone has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Well, to have our sins forgiven, that has to do with salvation. And so the elders come there uh, to visit with that person, and they are bringing the gospel. And 
and hopefully, and even that, although that person may be on the deathbed, even at that late stage, there might be salvation for that individual. But under no circumstances is talking about physical healing. But, 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 but right here, it is very clear that he said, if you are sick, and the, 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 yes, also the, the, the area where he said, if you are sick, and the prayer offered in faith, we make the sick person well. Well, excuse me, we, excuse me, but you're not yeah. reading the whole sentence. Why does it say, if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him? What is that? If our sins have been forgiven, that is salvation. If uh, that, that is that, and if a person has become saved, he's been healed of the disease of sin, and he's, uh, he's, he was on his way to the most terrible death, uh, eternal damnation, and now he has been given eternal life. That establishes the, uh, what this verse is talking about. And when you uh, read this and try to make that physical healing, then the the verse has lost all of its substance. It's it's uh, it's uh, because what good is it if somebody becomes physically well? Uh, uh, tomorrow they get another disease, and eventually they're going to die anyway. Uh, that becoming physically well, that would be, if that was the purpose of the gospel, it would be an enormous disaster because we all die eventually. But when it talks here about someone having their sins forgiven, that's big time. That's that's super marvelous. And that's uh, like we read in First Peter, where, which quotes from Isaiah 53, that by his stripes we are healed because we were wandering as sheep. That is, we are healed of our sins, and now we're no longer wandering. We are in the sheepfold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, was it in God's plan that we that people should be sick at all when God created um, uh, human beings? Well, look, you, 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 ask, let me ask you this: uh, Is if someone is perfectly well? and they're in the prime of health, and they don't know the Lord Jesus, uh, uh, but yet they, they are physically as well as possible, and they're just enjoying life right to the fullest. And over here, here's a person that's on, has been sick half of his life, and he just never, never gets off his sick bed, and yet he is a child of God. His sins have all been paid for. Where would you rather be? Where would you rather be? With which, which, with which, with which one of these would you rather be? Uh, if, if you are saved, your intention is to live in perfect health. I think that would be the intention of everybody that is saved. If you are saved, you would like to live in perfect health, because the Bible says that uh, uh, um, the, 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 the lifespan of a man is 120 years in Genesis. So why will somebody all of, all of, automatically die at the age of 60 when um, the Bible clearly states that the, the lifespan of a man is say, around 20 years? Yeah, well, the fact is that uh, uh, I don't care how much people want to become well. They're all going to die, or unless Christ comes first. Everybody is going to die, and eventually you're going to die of a disease. And if that's what the gospel is, then it is a hopeless gospel. And that's exactly the focal point a lot of people place on the gospel, that it gives you physical health. And, and they have a hopeless gospel because they can't win. Eventually you're going to die. You can't deny that. But on the other hand, the truth of the gospel is that it is a win-win situation because no matter how physically sick you are, if you are a child of God, like the beggar that uh, was uh, the outside of the uh, rich man's gate in Luke 16, the dogs licked his sores, he had nothing at all, and yet he had Christ, and so when he died, he went into Abraham's bosom. He had everything, and that's what the gospel is. That is uh, the wonderful, wonderful character of the gospel. So take your pick. Do you want a gospel of physical health? All right, have that gospel, but I'm telling you, it is utterly hopeless, and it is not biblical either. 
but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, hello. I have a question uh, about the time of when Jesus Christ was crucified. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, is it true that when he was arrested, he was given the, the people of the place where he lived were given a choice whether they could save him, spare him from from being crucified, or <clears throat> but they chose someone else? Well, what happened was that he was uh, on trial before Pilate. Now, Pilate was a Roman judge who represented Caesar, the highest uh, ruler of the, of the world of that day, and, and who was really a, representation, a representative of God. And Pilate, uh, he examined Jesus very carefully, and he couldn't find any sin in Jesus. Uh, uh, Pilate didn't know something. He didn't know that Jesus stood there laden with my sins, every dirty, rotten one of them, and the sins of everybody else that he had come to save. But Pilate couldn't see that. All he saw was Jesus himself, and he could not see any sin. And there was no sin in Jesus himself. So he had analyzed that correctly. But here are the Jews clamoring that he be crucified. They wanted him dead because they are are playing into God's hand that Christ had to be crucified. He had to be hung on a cross to, to demonstrate that he had become a curse on behalf of all that he had come to save. But Pilate didn't know any of that. And so Pilate, Pilate came up with a, with a stratagem. It was customary at the Passover time that uh, that uh, Pilate would uh, set free one prisoner, however bad that prisoner might have been, uh, in order to please the Jews, because he's a Roman uh, Roman governor over the Jewish nation, and in order to maintain uh, a rapport with them, uh, the, uh, the the rule was that at the Passover he could set one man free, no matter how bad that person was, and he would allow the Jews to select that man. Now it had turned out that there was a man by the name of Barabbas, and he was a very notable prisoner. He was a murderer, he was a robber, a very, very bad man. And so Pilate thought, well, okay, now I'm going to offer to the Jews to release uh, one of the two, Jesus or Barabbas. And certainly these Jews would recognize that Barabbas is far more evil than this Jesus. And, and Pilate could see all the evil in Barabbas, whereas he couldn't see any evil in Jesus. So he says, uh, you can choose who you want to have me set free. And they chose Barabbas, because they desperately wanted Jesus crucified. So Barabbas was set free. Now in doing this, they uh, God is uh, guiding all of this, of course, and, and God is setting up a beautiful, beautiful picture of salvation. Barabbas really was a representation of all of us before we are saved, uh, and and uh, and we are despicable sinners under the wrath of God. We deserve to go to hell. But here God is crucifying Jesus, making him a curse so that we might be set free. Those who are saved are set free because Jesus took uh, uh, came under the wrath of God. And that's the picture that is painted here, uh, the portrait that we see here as we read about Barabbas. It's interesting, the name Barabbas means son of the father. And when we have become saved, we are sons of the father. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this uh, is just one of the beautiful uh, developments that we see in the crucifixion of Christ. So, is, is that a story that's in the Bible? 
that's in the Bible. I've, I've, put, uh, I've, yeah, you can find in this story very clearly, uh, given in the Bible. It's, uh, it, it'll be in the near the end of the Gospel of Matthew, or the near the end of the Gospel of Mark, or the Gospel of Luke. I don't remember which uh, of the of the Gospels where it is found. Can I ask you one more question? And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Campy. Yes. Um, I, I just think it's wonderful that the, uh, the, the scriptures and, and the many examples that's replete with uh, uh, talk of, of rain being synonymous with the Word of God and the Word of God going forth. And I was wondering if you could read Psalms chapter 68, verses 6 through 9. Psalm 68, verse 6 through 9. There we read. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Now, before we're saved, we're bound in the chains of sin and Satan. We're bound, uh, we're bound as a matter of fact, to go to hell. And he brings us forth. Uh, and uh, when he saves us, but those who remain rebellious, they dwell in a dry land. That is, there is no gospel there. The water in the Bible is used as a figure of the gospel. And then it goes on. O oh God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou, O God, did send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. And the inheritance are, are, comes to those who were the elect of God, and it was the rain of the gospel, the fact that the gospel came from heaven like rain comes on the on the dry land and, and the lush vegetation results. So as the gospel comes into the world, the vegetation of uh, the, har the harvest of believers uh, springs forth from this. Thank you very much, Brother Campy. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good yes, evening. Yes, I have a question. You, uh, you said uh, last week that we'll never remember this life no more. There was a passage in Scripture that uh, said that we'll remember this life no more. Can you tell me where that is in Scripture? Yes, that's Isaiah chapter 66. Let me check that a moment. Isaiah chapter chapter 65, rather, verse 17 for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former, that is the former earth, this present earth, shall not be remembered nor come into mind. I have one other question. The other question is, you mentioned that the 1,290 days last week, and you ran out of time, and you said you were going to pick it up this week. Well, the 1,290 days are referred to in the last chapter of Daniel, Daniel 12. And it, uh, they're spoken of in... Well, let me read that a moment. Uh, in Daniel 12. Daniel 12, uh, where we read in verse 11, And from the time the daily shall be taken away, and that could be the daily candlestick or the daily offering. In other words, the gospel is silenced because that's what is in view when it talks about the daily being taken away. Uh, and the abomination that maketh desolate, desolate set up, that has to do with Satan beginning to rule in the churches and congregations. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, this is a very curious verse. Uh, and, and we wonder, what is God talking about? We, we uh, first of all, search the Bible. Is, are there any two events that were separated by 1,290 days? 
And I'm not aware of any place in the Bible of two events that are separated by 1290 days. However, if we uh, remember that frequently God uses a day for a year, uh, this is not uncommon that he does this, that a day represents a year. And so if we apply that principle, uh, then we could say, well, all right, then let's look at 1290 years. Well, then we remember that in Acts 6 or Acts 7, I, uh, we find that one of those two chapters, we find that the time when, J when uh, Jacob and his family came into Egypt to escape the famine at the time that Joseph had, his son had become prime minister over Egypt, that was called a time of great tribulation. And that term, Great Tribulation, is only found four times in the, in the Bible. And so, immediately, that becomes very significant. I better give the reference for that. That's, uh, let me see, that's Acts, that's Acts, uh, Acts, um, uh, 7 verse 11 uh, now is Acts 7 verse 11 now there came a dearth that is a, fa a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction but that word affliction is the same Greek word that's translated tribulation so it's great tribulation now we happen to know the year that this happened that Jacob left the land of Canaan to go into Egypt and we also know why that would have been great tribulation it happened in the year 1877 BC and it must have been an enormous shock to Jacob to do this because God had given the land of Canaan to the family of Jacob it had been given to his grandfather Abraham his father Isaac and they had lived there for 215 years and God had earlier commanded, don't, if there's famine, don't go out of Egypt. And now God is commanding him to go into the land of Egypt. And, and it's, just, uh, it's just something that is, is an awful thing to do. Uh, after all, uh, it would be so easy to solve the problem. His son Joseph was prime, prime minister over Egypt, and he could easily send a few wagon loads of grain to the land of Canaan from time to time so that Jacob would not have to leave. But here Jacob is commanded to leave. And we know that was the year 1877. And because of the term Great Tribulation, we know it was a picture or portrait of the Great Tribulation that is in our day. The same language is used. Well, then we look, wonder, well, what happened 1290 years later? Because, remember, we're looking at that time, a time span uh, of 1290 years later. And lo and behold, it falls on the year 587 B.C. And for, uh, according to the biblical calendar, 587 B.C. was also a time of great tribulation. It was a year that Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And, and uh, it was, uh, it was uh, which in itself is a great type or picture of the great tribulation of our day. Well, then if we extend that once more, we have to apply another principle. God frequently uses the principle of one-third, two-thirds. And, uh, and uh, uh, if we go uh, 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 twice, 1290 years from 587, we arrive at the year 1994, uh, just a few years ago. Now, we wonder, well, uh, is that accidental or is that important? Well, the fact is, all the evidence is that the, the, the world is under, and the church is under great tribulation. And so it looks like it is pointing to 1994 as a very, very important official year in the whole business of the timing of the great tribulation that God is talking about in Matthew 24, and uh, and it, it fits into the into the uh, uh, 
our program of 1290 days uh, identifying with a time when when the gospel is uh, is silenced when the daily uh, sacrifice or the daily candlestick is taken away because that is what has happened in the churches and so we could say in a sense it marks the official end of the church age or we could say it in another way it marks the official time of the beginning of the latter reign when God is not using churches anymore he's not using a, an organization of some kind to bring the gospel but from now on during the final season which is a little season uh, it, uh, it uh, he is using individuals uh, uh, he is uh, the gospel is going out strictly by individuals and not by an organization like uh, uh, during the time of the nation of Israel, they were the custodian of the gospel. And through the church age, the local churches were the custodian of the gospel. But now we have to pause for this message, and then we'll go to our next caller. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. I had a uh, comment first and then a question. The comment is, here on the East Coast of New Jersey, at WFME, where faith means everything, uh, it seems that we're having a little difficulty with on uh, Sunday morning, the Lord's Day, that um, the programming is mostly hymns and Bible reading, which is part of fellowship for coming out of churches. I understand that. Uh, my comment is that if some message could be passed on to the producers at the programming department for Sunday that uh, we need more teachers for, to explain the Bible. It was usually 8.20 to 8.40, 10 minutes of Bible teaching, and then 11.20 to 11.40. And I was wondering if there was a problem with, uh, you know, getting teachers to... No, uh, you know, this is a matter that we are presently addressing. We're thinking through again how... We want to have our Sunday programming. We're not satisfied with it the way it is presently. It is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not that bad, but we think it can be improved. So we are working on that question, and I appreciate your comment. Okay, and my question was in uh, Psalm 46, verse 10. Psalm 46, verse 10. Let, let me look at that. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And what is your question? Well, when uh, God tells us to be still and know that I am God, is this being biblically interpreted to, you know, have everything out of our lives and just concentrate on the Bible and not let outside influences come into our lives? Well, we, we of course wish we could concentrate all the time on the Bible, but we do have to make a living. We do have to interface with our fellow man. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we have to live our lives in this world, and so these pressures do come upon us. But the, the, uh, the wonderful fact is that if we're a child of God, we can constantly, constantly lean back on God's almighty arms and and uh, talk to the Lord about it, and and uh, knowing that He knows all about it and that He is in charge, and so that can give us great comfort. But the context here, you know, is He maketh wars to cease under the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in a fire. Be still and know that I am the Lord. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Mankind has got a big voice. They know I am number one. I have the truth. I I uh, have wisdom, I this, I that, I the other thing. And and mankind is uh, at war with God. And God comes and say, says, be still, be still. You don't know anything. You are uh, in deep trouble. You have no real wisdom. 
Uh, your wisdom is tainted with sin. You only have peanut minds to, to begin with. You can't understand an infinite God in any way. And, and so on. Uh, listen to me. I am God. And you are not God. I am God. And that's why we, uh, as believers, want to direct each other into the Word of God, into the Bible. Because there we are silenced as we listen to God's voice. Let Him speak. Let's learn from Him and, uh, and not try to trust in our own wisdom at all. Because in our own wisdom we're going to end up... Like uh, verse 9, we're going to be in rebellion against God. And give thanks. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, this is Catherine Robinson. Yes. Yes, um, in the Bible, in Matthew uh, chapter 18, I would like to say that verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that is so very true because um, that is, uh, am I right when I say you need to be baptized and also um, be instructed by the Word of God for, the, for your whole life? and. and it does not end there. Um, you need to study, actually, the Word of God and, and study the Bible and be instructed by Jesus and have Jesus beside you every moment and well, every well, hour of the day. Let me, let me ask you a question. Can a year-old baby become saved? Oh, yes. All right. Now, how much can that year-old baby or that six-months-old baby know about the Word of God? How much... Uh, how how uh, much instruction have they had in the Word of God? What I'm saying, uh, I will say this: if that child is baptized, he has he has received the seed, the a small mustard seed, and as that child grows, if that child has parents that are Christians, he will be taught. Well, but 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 excuse me now. The baptism, that has to do with putting, uh, uh, sprinkling some water on that baby. Now, how did that water do something for him? What, how can physical water have any spiritual uh, impact upon a person? How can that spiritual water change that person in any way at all spiritually? That, that's not possible. That's only physical water. And as a matter of fact, that water is only a sign, it's a shadow, pointing to the fact that that child needs to be saved, that he needs to be, uh, have its sins washed away. And we can't do that. God has to do that. But the fact is that God has to do the saving. And he can save a baby six months old who has been, who has been baptized or not baptized. Water baptism is not a condition in any way. It's uh, throughout the church age, it was a sign that God wanted to be in evidence as an assist to uh, have a picture of what is required for salvation. That is, even as water washes dirt away, so uh, the washing of the, uh, we have to have our sins washed away by the water of the gospel. But, uh, but we, we, that doesn't set up anybody for salvation. It's only God who can do that saving. And, and we, we want to put our children in an environment where they can hear the word of God. Because what is the bless, what is the statement? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I recommend to uh, pregnant mothers that uh, as they're carrying their children in their womb, uh, be under the hearing of the Word of God because your children in your womb are hearing the Word of God and they don't have to understand it. God can uh, can give that child, that unborn child, spiritual ears to hear so that through it God can save that, that child. He's, God is not limited in any way. And we don't, we don't get the per child saved. God does the saving and we have to recognize that. 
very, very definitely. Uh, there are a lot of children who have uh, have been told you're saved because you were baptized in water and you've been uh, catechized and you have uh, ma finally made confession of faith, but that doesn't prove that they're saved. They're, the only way they can become saved is if God saves them, and then we'll find they'll find in their life an intense desire to do the will of God. They'll have a love for the Word of God and, and a real desire to be obedient to the Word of God. Great. Now, I have one more question, please, uh, if I may. Um, when I was uh, 23 years old, I was uh, pregnant. I lost my first husband, and I, I was four months pregnant when I lost my baby. Now, I understand that God knows of us before we are even in our mother's even in our mother's womb. He knows of us. I understand that. Now, this child, I believe, is in heaven, whether it was baptized or not. Well, so I, that, I truly that, believe that. How can you believe that when you believe? Because that? I was a Christian and at that time, and I prayed and I uh, asked Jesus to please take him to heaven where he would be safe with my yes. husband that died also. Yeah. Well, we don't know whether a baby that dies uh, is saved or not. If it was one of God's elect, like David's little son that was born out of uh, wedlock, it was born in, in, in uh, as an adulterous relationship, and yet God revealed to David, and uh, because holy men of old spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved, he moved them, that this baby was saved because David said, I shall go to be with him. And that was to emphasize that no matter how sinful the, the situation was that produced that baby, that baby still can become saved. But on the other hand, we read uh, Psalm 58 where God says the wicked and, and everyone by nature is wicked. The wicked go astray from their mother's womb speaking lies, and then it speaks about God's judgment on them. So if that baby is one of God's elect, we know it went to heaven. If it is not one of God's elect, then God, uh, we, ha we have to just leave that with the Lord as to uh, uh, the, f the fact that that, per that baby, too, is under the wrath of God. But we do know this, that God does everything perfectly. And, uh, and if we have a child that dies very young, we comfort ourselves that God does, is a God to us and our children, and we're hoping and trusting that maybe God in his mercy also saved this little one. But our real comfort, our final comfort is, but we know that whatever is, God does everything perfectly. And there is nothing that is imperfect in any way in what he does and and that consoles us that we can just leave it all together uh, up to the Lord oh yes of course and uh, by faith I do truly believe that my husband my first husband uh, is in heaven with my child I truly believe that with all of my heart and Jesus is does walk with me every day every day of my life um he, i am a sinner of course i i am a child of god and i try tell me one thing when people say uh, uh colors of people different colors of people they uh, accidentally or purposely say well just because they're black just because they're a mexican or whatever i i i say to them this we are all flowers of god's field and he has a very large field that is what they understand we well, are yes, all children yes. of god's field flowers of god's field yeah well the fact is that the Bible is utterly transparent to color. You know, whether you're black or white or brown skinned or yellow skinned or, or uh, whatever, is makes absolutely no difference. We're all of one blood. We're all uh, sons of Adam, and uh, and uh, therefore it's a it's a terribly wrong thing to look upon anybody's skin color or nationality or from. 
uh, their heritage, uh, uh, political heritage or whatever it is, and look upon them uh, uh, down a long nose as somebody who is less. Uh, the opposite is true. We are to be, each of us, we are to walk very humbly. We read of Jesus. He was meek and lowly of heart, and he was eternal God himself. There is the supreme example. He was meek and lowly of heart. And if he was, then we better be super meek and lowly because we don't even begin to stand up against the Lord Jesus. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, I have a scripture for you that I would like your uh, interpretation on, and that is uh, 1 John 3, sorry. 1 John uh, it's, chapter... Um, it's the first epistle of Peter, chapter 2, verse 12. Oh, 1 Peter 2, verse 12? Correct. Okay, let's look at that. 1 Peter 2, verse 12. Having your conversation, now the word conversation is an old English word that means conduct or behavior. Having your behavior honest among the Gentiles, the word Gentiles is the world, the nations of the world, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Now what is your question? Excuse me. Well, well what does uh, God mean by the day of visitation? Is that is that the um, the moment that He uh, plants the seed and no, the, the day of visitation is judgment day. Wherever you see that word day of visitation, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it always is pointing to uh, judgment day. And uh, and uh, you know it's uh, it's curious. Remember when Achan was uh, was found guilty of hiding uh, the gold wedge and the and so on in his tent, and and then God found him out, and and then God is going to punish him in the sight of all the Israel, and Joshua said to uh, uh, Achan under the uh, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's saying, uh, "My son, glorify, give God the glory." And did you do this? Did you do that? And uh, uh, you see, at the moment of the day of visitation, we give God the glory for all that he is. We, uh, all of our life, we've lived wickedly. We've gone our own way. We, we think we know more than God. We don't want to give him any credit for anything. We, we, uh, we think we know. And, but on the day of visitation... We are going to glorify God, and we're going to glorify Him as we also see those who have become saved. That uh, we see those who uh, have uh, have come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus, because they're the proof that everything that God had prophesied, had promised, had committed Himself to do, had taken place, both in the fact that he saved individuals and in the fact that he's bringing the unsaved to judgment. And so uh, this, I think, is uh, included in what is emphasized here, that in the day of visitation, these individuals who are evildoers, uh, uh, they, uh, having seen your good works, and now seeing that, and, and uh, if they're a product of the fact you've become saved, and they see the reality of salvation in your life, they will glorify God. It'll be another aspect of them giving glory to God, that God's salvation plan uh, worked out exactly the way it was supposed to. I find it interesting that an unbeliever at the uh, time of appearing of Christ will glorify God for works that he has seen in, uh, in believers. Um, well, well this, this is why I quoted from, from uh, the book of Judges, or, or Joshua, where it talks about Achan, because why would J Joshua tell Achan, give God the glory? 
give God the glory. He just about, at right at that point, he's going to uh, cause, uh, uh, or God is going to, to destroy uh, Achan. But, uh, but it's the moment of truth, you see. This, this is why God is glorified. It is the moment of truth. And, and the unbelievers at that moment, no matter how uh, dense they have been before, now they are go they're going to know where truth is, that God is God, and that these who uh, profess to be believers and, and, and showed that they were true believers, uh, that they are indeed uh, are true, uh, have, have, because we're, we're going to find, uh, you know, it reminds me of a verse in, uh, in uh, Revelation 11 where, where it talks about the two witnesses are, are uh, uh, we read in, uh, uh, in verse 12. Uh, and, and they heard a great voice. These are the two witnesses that have finished their testimony at the end of the latter reign. It's the, it's the end of the world. And uh, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Well, the enemies are the ones who are the unbelievers. They beheld them. Uh, and and so the uh, on the last day when the believers are raptured, uh, the uh, the all the unsaved who are the enemies of the gospel are going to be glorifying God, not with happiness, not with joy, but they but the fact that they recognize that God is God. They have denied that God is God. They didn't want to serve Him. Now they recognize He is. As a matter of fact. Uh, they are going to stand and answer to that God, and they can't avoid it. And so they will be glorifying God by their obedience at that time and by their recognition of what God has done. Wonderful. Thank you, Lord, for Family Radio. Thanks, Brother Campaign. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Yes, Brother Campaign on the passage from Timothy that says that we, a woman should not teach or have authority over men. Yes. Does this apply just to uh, biblical instruction or this wouldn't apply to colleges and things like that, would it? Well, you know, I've, I've asked myself that question uh, many, many times. I do know that the, 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 the instruction in the Bible uh, does apply to the home, the husband and wife relationship. It does about, apply to, in the churches during the uh, church age, and it does apply uh, insofar as the gospel is concerned. Now, whether that applies in the marketplace, out in the secular world, I don't know. I do not know whether it applies. I don't uh, have enough information from the Bible to answer that. I have one other question. Approximately what is required in the way of an annual budget for family radio each year? Well, our, our budget runs a, 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 about a million dollars a month, a little more than a million dollars a month. I was just uh, curious because uh, another Christian station here locally was had their sheriff on or whatever they call it, and they, they needed five million. But thank you, Brother Kennedy. Yeah, you see, and we get a lot of mileage from that. You know, we have, we own over 40 stations here in the United States. We have over 100, around 120 translators, which are miniature stations. We have Radio School of the Bible, uh, which ministers to thousands upon thousands in a free way. Uh, all over the world and particularly to a great many people who are in prison we uh, reach out uh, into most of the continents of the world uh, with the gospel in a, in a very very uh, definite way so we get an enormous amount of mileage out of that money one of our tasks as as administrators of family radio is to try to spend money as wisely as possible. I like to use the phrase, it's a, it's a very trite phrase, but it's, we want to get the most bang we can from the buck. We, uh, we try to, to uh, uh, 
uh, sequence how we can reach the most people with the least amount of money. And so uh, it's a, it's, it's a really a, a wonderful thing that we're able to reach so many people with, with that kind of a budget. There are churches that have budgets that are bigger than that. Uh, and, and yet, uh, but we have to constantly uh, watch the dollars and spend that money very, very wisely because uh, uh, otherwise it wouldn't, wouldn't go. And, of course, uh, the wonderful thing is that as we step out in faith in a, uh, like when we're now building a facility to go into the Philippines and Indonesia, that's going to cost a lot of money. And yet... We know that this is simply an opportunity for more people, more people who are listeners to Family Radio and who love the Lord to decide, yes, I want a part two. That's an opportunity for me also to uh, uh, obey God's command to share the gospel. And, and uh, all we can do is pledge to you that, that whatever is given is going to be used as wisely as possible. I agree with you. You get family radio gets maximum use from the dollars. I agree with you 100 percent. And thank you, brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, I have a question for you about uh, uh, divorce. You know, I've been listening to so for. Uh, almost uh, two years now. I respect and appreciate a lot of things that you have to say. When the woman was at the well and the Lord said to her, how many husbands do you have? And she said she had none. And he said, you've spoken well because thou hast had seven husbands. Isn't that correct? Five husbands and the man you're now living with is not your husband. Remember what he's told her that? You see, in other words, uh, she had five husbands that she married, each one, and so it was a marriage. Now she's living with a man in adultery. Uh, he is not her husband. Okay, but, okay, this is my question. When it says what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, how, how do we know that God is the one who has put a marriage together? Because that is an institution designed by God from the very beginning. Remember in Matthew 19 and Mark 11, God says from the beginning, God made the man male and female, and, uh, and, uh, and he, he joined Adam and Eve together in marriage. And that from that on, time on, any time two people uh, come together in, in the intimacy of marriage, uh, God uh, and uh, God has established the the marriage institution, and every nation has their own rules as to what constitutes a legal marriage. But they do have marriages uh, because that is what God has has uh, uh, placed within the thinking of mankind that there 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 that there is such a thing as a legitimate legal marriage and. Uh, and, and then it's a marriage of God because all mankind started out with Adam and Eve. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. Now we've come to the end of our time. I'm sorry we can't visit any longer, but the Lord willing, we will be back together tomorrow evening for another edition of the Open Forum. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.